December 24th dinner with the family and at my house. Humorous audiobook. Written by Geronimo Lopez Soldevilla. Any resemblance with reality is pure coincidence, any similarity with current events, people or places, alive or not, real or fictitious, is mere coincidence and product of a feverish imagination run amok on the part of the author. For best results use headphones, although it is not strictly necessary to enjoy the content. Today I am going to tell you about the typical December 24th dinner on Christmas Eve that took place in my house last year, anticipating that this year's dinner, by tradition, is expected to be very similar. Let me begin by introducing the protagonists of such an important event. My father. My father has always worked as a teacher and this year he is out of work because the new curriculum implemented by the government forced him to attend classes in person, and since my father got his job many years ago he has been tutoring and advising from the neighborhood bar, he decided that this job was not what he wanted in life and quit, which is why he is now unemployed and suffering from post-traumatic stress according to the social security doctor, also a friend, colleague and one of his most outstanding students at the recently closed neighborhood bar. About my father's doctor friend, it is important to note that he had the habit of diagnosing with attention deficit to children who came to his office in the insurance. And in collusion with school principals and their psychopedagogical teams recommended to the mothers of the children, that, to avoid this attention deficit and hyperactivity, it was necessary to take certain pills, whose exclusive distribution, through apocryphal prescriptions was effectively in charge of this doctor. My father, as is customary every year, is in charge of making dinner for everyone, I have never really known if it is because he really likes the art of cooking or because he spends the whole night boasting about his culinary skills while he exposes to each and every one of those attending the dinner the ingredients, the place where he bought them and how he did it all, through a presentation with slides, videos concept maps and even a feedback exercise, which he calls graduation exam, and which is mandatory to pass it with a grade higher than 8 in order to be able to eat. To date, we have all passed the test, not without great effort, both individually and as a team. I do not want to imagine the day when someone does not pass the test or dares to tell you that the only noticeable odor at dinner is that of his bad breath which is accompanied by a halitosis capable of knocking down a horse, I mean a horse, a herd of horses, with a mere sigh. My mother. My mother, for her part, as usual in these dates of the calendar, is dedicated to prepare the table, which she decorates with a tablecloth and the corresponding napkins to match, with elaborate. Embroidery and intricate threads of fine wool that her mother, that is, my grandmother, Made with her own hands, this tablecloth has a great sentimental value for the whole family, as we all recognize both the enormous work and the years spent by the grandmother in its elaboration, in such a way that the table linen has become an irreplaceable part of the family tradition. In the same way, as part of the Christmas protocol, my mother spends entire hours decorating the table with the utmost delicacy and detail, placing the finest china, glassware and cutlery we have, which she arranges and adjusts with almost millimetric precision. My grandfather. My grandfather, on his mother's side, during these dates, is recognized in the family for being an enthusiast of the Christmas atmosphere, and for that reason since the month of October he dedicates himself to decorate the Christmas tree and the nativity scene, looking for new pieces, spheres, lights and as many miniatures and figures as he can find in the markets with a credit card, which he finishes paying for 18 months later. My grandmother. My grandmother, also on her mother's side, is the happiest of all at this time of the year because she is dedicated to criticize everyone by phone, to prepare the Christmas atmosphere, and from what I have observed, it seems that this year, Grandma has been spreading the news for three months in a row that she has evidence. Photos and videos showing that there are marital infidelities in the family and that at the dinner on December 24th she has the clear intention of telling who it is. 
They say in my grandmother's neighborhood, that she lost both ears, sliced off in a street fight with butter knives, as a result of an argument with another woman, about the number of men who had offended them to the point of crying because of such degrading and unbearable humiliations, difficult for its crudeness to bear in conscience, although both women came to recognize that they were deserving of them after the fight. My sister. About my sister I can comment that when she turned her first 13 springs or 12 according to the bad tongues, and in order to celebrate her fifth or sixth pregnancy according to those same tongues, she had tattooed herself in front of the rearview mirror of a motorcycle parked in a dark parking lot of the neighborhood mall, with a second-hand stolen drill, Santa Muerte on her forehead with the face of Bob Sponge. Due to the damage my sister had done to her face, she would require for life the massive and regular intake of a mixture of estrogens and testosterone of animal origin, which she consumed in a compulsive manner, according to her medical reports that catalogued her as bipolar manic and depressive. This hormonal mixture was obtained on the black market, through my father's doctor friend, who was also dedicated to defraud people through a cell phone from the prison where he was serving a sentence for telephone extortion, with the aggravating factor that his extorted public were the children who came to his office with their mothers in search of pills to relieve the hyperactivity detected by the directors and psychopedagogical teams of their schools. My sister had married a year ago, and made the decision at her wedding celebration party to move into her in-law's house with her husband, his mother, and her siblings with their respective partners and children, where they live in a house with rooms that are differentiated from each other by the type of graffiti painted on the cement walls of each room. Well, on her wedding day, according to the words of my sister, poured in the toast to their marriage union, were those of having the firm intention of being happy and wanting to enjoy freedom, privacy and personal independence, a matter she decided, after observing how in her new political family, while some put in their pockets even the soup plates to take away, others sneaked the drinks to the trunks of their cars where they offered them to passers-by at modest prices. The party was paid for entirely by the bride's family. After my sister's decision to marry her current husband, in her room, where her crib once stood, now sits a bright red water mattress in the shape of a heart next to a mahogany desk, on which sits a computer with a barcode and a legend that reads, material owned by Social Security. My brother-in-law. My brother-in-law still works as a driver of a children's transport for the children of the workers of a supermarket chain, where he is very famous and recognized for his Parkinson's disease, addiction to opium, amphetamines and antidepressants that he usually mixes with pure 90 proof alcohol before driving. In this sense, my brother-in-law has never had any accidents and is often rewarded as the most responsible worker in his company, which operates under corruption schemes whereby the national subsidiary of the company requests permits from local authorities in exchange for guaranteeing a vote in the local elections, in exchange for guaranteeing the vote in the local elections of all its workers, in order to have a free hand in the granting of permits for the construction of more stores. In the country through bribes, which allow them to violate existing laws on construction and land use, and that despite having evidence of hundreds of suspicious payments that left no room for any doubt on the matter, this is a company in which its directors are more concerned about damage control, than to correct the problem. And I, well, I am single in a city where the only fun for young people, and also for the elderly is to go out to the street to look for relationships empty of feeling or responsibilities through applications on the phone, where it is known that the profile pictures are fake and tricked. And being, as things are, as I am single and every year I bring a new partner to my house, being that this year I did not have one, I decided to bring a friend I met at a party organized by a bar that was closing for lack of liquid due to unpaid bills by its customers, and of whom I do not remember her face or her name. And it is at this point, after a brief introduction of the protagonists of my family that I begin the narration of the events that took place at the dinner. Since my father lost his job, about eight months ago, 
my father adopted the habit of staying at home and inviting his friends to watch soccer matches, sporting events, which still today, they can enjoy in its entirety, because in addition to being hung electricity to street lighting, it is also hung to the internet of the neighbors. And the night of the 24th was not going to be the exception. So, around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, their friends began to arrive in trickle, who, between laughter and welcoming comments, ostensibly noted the detail of showing how each one, as if it were a precious trophy, to manifest the possession of a bottle of liquor as a trophy just won in the final of a sports competition, to then take their place in the gigantic armchair that we have in the living room, which was once in the social security office of my father's doctor friend, an armchair that can comfortably seat up to 15 people. The friend's ritual always began with beer, bags of chips and assorted nuts. Once this first act was over, they would begin a second one, with the alcohol of each one's taste, first with short drinks, in almost empty glasses and with ice, and then moving on to almost full glasses, longer drinks, sporadic in time, and without anything containing water. It was precisely in this part of the cycle, where everyone became lifelong compadres, where everyone loved each other very much and appreciated each other as their best friends. The next step consisted of drinking everything there was, no longer at the table, but in the house, without regard and directly sharing the bottle without any glass, at this point only the shards of glass were left scattered everywhere, where, as was customary, one of the compadres would go from heated discussion to blows. The fourth act consisted of crawling to the bathroom to do a belly dance, urinating on the walls, going back down the stairs while disguising the loss of balance, hugging the railing and asking for something to eat. The fifth consisted of sleeping all huddled together on the couch. The sixth consisted of getting up late the next day and repeating the previous steps. Being today such a special date, the ritual was altered, since previously each of the attendees to the dinner had to deliver in advance a personal menu with their culinary preferences, with which, my father was during the three weeks prior to the event searching in the supermarket chain where my brother-in-law works, the best possible price for each and every one of the delicacies that all his friends wanted to order. I explained to him that when I say the best price, it is the price that my father considers the fairest, which is none other than getting what he wants for free. So he previously agreed with his friend the social security doctor to use the children of the workers of the chain of which my brother-in-law is the designated driver, to fill the children's backpacks and pockets with the necessary ingredients for the dinner, not without first agreeing with the directors and psychopedagogical teams of the children's schools to donate part of the products purchased to non-profit aid associations in exchange for false invoices, which would then be delivered to the supermarket chain's purchasing manager, who would justify a higher than usual expense, and from which he would pocket the total amount of the alleged purchase. So far everything was going according to plan, but plans, like dates with beautiful women, are unpredictable, so it didn't take long for the first unforeseen event to arise, since the living room. Table was occupied by the tableware that my mother had worked so hard to assemble and that, in addition, it occurred to my grandfather to get up early that day with the idea of moving the Christmas tree and the nativity scene with all its members and figures to place them in front of the television set. Among my father's friends, the one that stood out for its special personality was the one they all called Little Christmas Tree, because it was rumored that he had the balls as ornaments. Christmas tree every time he drank, and he drank more than the fish in the river, his face became unhinged, and he tended to eat with his mouth open, showing that he was hungrier than a blind man's dog, while he made strange grimaces with movements that sometimes seemed involuntary because of the speed with which he made them, which he accompanied with convulsions in his lips, which fluttered like jellies do when they shake. This man moved around in a wheelchair, assisted with oxygen and carrying a permanent catheter, which did not prevent him from boasting that he was always the first to hit others without warning. He was a bulky, large, dark-faced man, a face that seemed to want to get out of his own face, bulging outwards, 
with cheeks that hung almost to his shoulders, the wrinkles that appeared on that face seemed to draw deep furrows drawn by the plow of a tractor in a rough terrain, the skin was very reddish, like rusty iron, the eyes, seemed as if buried in two superb caves surprisingly large, like restaurant trays. Mr. Christmas Tree, as I have already mentioned, was wearing a probe tied to the back of the chair and an oxygen bottle with a mask included, although I must clarify that the bulging of his face was not due to the plastic mask. That being so, Christmas Tree, when he realized that there was a Christmas tree in front of the TV, without commenting anything to anyone, and showing that he was always the first to strike without warning, directly and without a word, he grabbed the Christmas tree that my grandfather had been decorating for three months to throw it with extreme violence against the table intended for dinner, that my mother was also placing with extreme precision, to break with a single blow all the crockery and glassware that he found in his path. My father's friends, upon seeing such an exhibition of strength and dexterity on the part of the Christmas tree, immediately jumped up from the armchair where they were quietly seated, to embrace each other effusively and applaud as if it were a penalty kick missed by the opposing team in the last minute, and which meant victory for the team of their preference. In fact, one of my father's friends applauded so loudly that he broke his wrists and both arms in three different places and had to be taken to the emergency room. Evidently if the previous act was like a penalty missed by the other team, the wincing and writhing of the friend with the broken arms meant that the penalty scored in the last minute was in favor, and in the hubbub, no one knows from where, but one of the liquor bottles, which was adulterated. Courtesy of my father's doctor friend from the social security, came to fall on the tablecloth, from which smoke began to come out, at the same time that it caught fire, as a consequence of the acid contained in the liquid spilled by the apocryphal liquor. The smoke grew thicker and thicker, so that the human Christmas tree, in the effort to lift the pine Christmas tree, had lost its oxygen mask, in its attempts to breathe, widened its already wide nose to such an extent that my two closed fists fit safely into each nostril. My grandfather, who seemed very furious, took advantage of the situation to embed in the holes exposed by the Christmas tree, all the little shepherds and animals that made up the nativity scene, which totaled more than 200. Faced with such a situation, my mother began to scream, which she did very well, but my grandmother, seeing how her tablecloth, made with her own hands when she was young, was consumed in the fire, in a fit of restrained anger, grabbed the probe hanging from the liver of the Christmas tree, to cut it viciously with a machete that she found on the back of the wheelchair, he then drank the entire contents in one gulp, leaving with this act a subliminal message of peace and love, which was immediately picked up by my father's euphoric friends, who instantly, like well-behaved children, sat back down on the couch to start chatting in a calm and collected manner. It was at that moment of apparent peace that the friend I was pretending to introduce to the family as my partner appeared, and whom I had met at a party organized by a bar that was closing due to lack of liquidity due to non-payment by its customers, and whose name, to this day, although I remember her face, I still do not remember her name. It was an apparently young woman who wore on her face a pimple the size of an avocado cut in half, in such a way that the thing seemed to have a life of its own, since it showed vital signs through a series of palpitations that gave the impression of wanting to come out of her face by itself. A woman dressed in a single piece of fine lingerie in tight black patent leather, with boots of the same material up to her knees, with a neckline that seemed to have more front than the borders of the Cold War and that as soon as she entered and saw my father's friends drinking like beasts without rest, without even taking time to breathe between drinks, she made a firm decision to show off with a dance that more than exotic seemed like a typical ritual of a tribe to scare away evil. Spirits, without even taking time to breathe between drinks, he made the firm decision to show off with a dance that more than exotic seemed like the typical ritual of a tribe to ward off evil spirits, without even taking the time to breathe between drinks, he made the firm decision to show off with a dance that more than exotic seemed like the typical ritual of a tribe to ward off evil spirits, but that immediately caught the attention of the drinkers who were on the couch. 
Some drinkers, who besides observing with attention to the improvised dancer, did not stop drinking, presenting at times, spaces of distraction, that the woman dressed in a single piece of fine lingerie in tight black patent leather, took the opportunity to take from each of them, the little they had in their wallets, which amounted to a respectable amount, with the well-founded hope that the next day none of them would remember what happened, as indeed it was. The hours passed and when night began to fall, my sister and brother-in-law showed up at my house. My sister at the moment she saw the woman dressed in a single piece of fine black tight-fitting patent leather lingerie, in a fit of envy, snatched from his hands the money of my father's friends that she was counting with great care, at the same time that with a quick movement, she managed to turn around to bury her two knees in the chest of the woman dressed in shiny black patent leather, and without a word, delivered such an atrocious impact, that the woman with the large cleavage, spun around three times and then jumped backwards with a high degree of difficulty worthy of the Olympic Games in a space of 10 meters, in a synchronized time of less than 10 seconds and thus, landed on her feet with her arms outstretched in the shape of an arc. This disrespect further infuriated my sister, who could do nothing about it because my brother-in-law had brought a fountain that had at its center the figure of a chubby boy who appeared to be urinating, and whose stream of liquid, my brother-in-law had arranged to be 24-year-old whiskey, courtesy of the commissions that the supermarket chain's head buyer had given him for transporting the employee's children with pockets full of the ingredients my father had ordered for that night's dinner. It was a fountain that, for both my father and his friends, appeared before their eyes as an oasis in the desert in which to immerse themselves in what seemed like a state of mystical hallucination. Flooded by the great joy that the fountain brought by my brother-in-law awakened in Christmas tree, who after giving an energetic impulse in which he transferred all his strength through his muscular arms over the metal hoops of his wheelchair, and by means of an abrupt but precise movement, Christmas tree headed towards the fountain with such extraordinary speed and power that he did not even have time to realize that he was not even aware of it, that he did not even have time to notice in any way, with a curb of approximately 10 centimeters surrounding that fountain from which the desired liquid of pleasure flowed without stopping, which, as an immediate consequence, made him fall forward with such a degree of violence that he fell face first on the only possible projection of the chubby child where he remained embedded. I well remember that my grandmother, although very angry at the previous actions of the Christmas tree against her handmade tablecloth when she was young, was the first to exclaim in fright at witnessing this disastrous spectacle. My God, that man is drowning, something must be done. Notice how he kicks harder and harder as he shakes his head from side to side, trying unsuccessfully, even with the help of his arms and resting his hands on the chubby boy's thighs, to pull his head out from between his legs, and all in vain. To which one of my father's friends hastened to respond immediately. Good thing we bought the chair with a spare wheel in the back, because with the blow one of them has been rendered useless. To which my father, by illusion, replied just as quickly. That's false. The chair was a donation made by a politician bribed by the supermarket chain where the person who brought the fountain works, who was running in a municipal election, and gave it to Mr. Christmas Tree, so that he could argue in a public act in the neighborhood square, as an act of solidarity, justifying that the wheelchair symbolized that taxes should be invested in infrastructure for high-speed trains. And in exchange for giving away the chair, he only asked those of us attending the political event to hand out electronic cards so that the neighbors could buy at the supermarket chain where the person who brought the fountain works, and thus ensure that the whole community would vote for him in three different polling stations in the same electoral district, using as a decoy the possibility of buying with that electronic card, tickets for the raffle of an airplane. While this conversation was taking place, the cries of the Christmas tree were getting louder and louder, and with a clamor that was really capable of tearing the soul, because they denoted the enormous pain to which the Christmas tree was subjected. For this reason, 
they opted for a group maneuver so that half of those present grabbed one leg of Christmas tree, and the other half the other, and thus, in this way, pull all together with all their strength to try to unblock the victim, which ended up being useless, because Christmas tree continued to keep his head completely embedded in the leg of the fatty, who also continued kicking and moving his arms with more force than before. Bad luck seemed to hover over that situation as if all the stars of the universe, under the premises of the law of attraction, had conspired to make it so, until my grandfather, who also had a pending account with Arbolito de Navidad, suggested that we take a rope out through the terrace, from the fifth floor where we live, and then tie it firmly to Arbolito's legs and pass the other end of the rope to the outside, where my grandfather had parked his truck and thus, link it to the fender. That's how my grandfather, jumping for joy, quickly went down the stairs to immediately start the van's engine, and once it was running, put it in reverse and pulled the rope tied to Arbolito's legs. The van began to roar to pull the rope to its maximum resistance, while the front wheels skidded on the asphalt due to Arbolito's weight, which made the rear of the vehicle move from side to side. Finally, and after several accelerations, Arbolito ended up being thrown off and projected against the opposite wall of the room, falling to the ground, bouncing, and being dragged the five floors down the stairs to the van, where he came to crash his forehead against the front axle bar, resulting in the engraving for life of the brand in the form of a peace symbol enclosed in a circle of my grandfather's German van. Thus, and after toasting everyone for such a feat, my father exempted everyone from the examination of the dinner, so everyone returned to toast, which is why my sister in the heat of the glasses launched a toast because at that moment she decided to return to live in our house with her in-laws, with her husband, his mother, and his brothers with their respective partners and children, being that between toasts and toasts the night passed us by. If you like the narration, please give me a like, subscribe and visit my channel where you can find varied content and where I will upload more short humorous audiobooks.